which that was pretty amazing um, because that's a long time. So uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about what they talked about, but uh, we'll dive in. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this time that you've allowed us to open your word. God, I pray that you would be in this place. I pray that your spirit would be here today. God, I pray that you would speak through me, that these would be your words and your thoughts, that they wouldn't be my thoughts or ideas or, or my words, but God, that they would be your words spoken directly to us. We thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we had a great VBS this year. Um, praise God, no one was seriously injured. Uh, if you'll remember last year, um, there were a few broken bones, people fell downstairs. Um, it was an all-out physical VBS. Um, this year, however, was not so physical, and we thank you. We thanks. We thank Jesus for that. We we praise God for that because uh, last year was kind of scary with people falling downstairs and uh, younger brothers trying to outdo older brothers out in games. Yep, Cindy did fall down the stairs. Um, Wayne broke his collarbone. Maria fell down the stairs. Um, Yep, another boy bruised his shoulder. So it was an all-out physical. This year wasn't as physical. I don't know that anybody broke anything. Um, so that was a positive. Yeah, I'm sure. Wayne did have some stipulations this year. He wasn't allowed to go outside. So he was my sidekick. Um, and then we kind of dropped him off in the uh, craft area. So... He had a good time with that. The other praise that we have is, uh, you, if you walk through the church, you'll notice the church looks kind of back to normal. We were able to donate a lot of our decorations to another church that's actually starting Wednesday, their VBS, um, down in Osage City. So the cool thing about that is we got a lot of our decorations from other churches, and now we're giving back to those other churches. <laughs> All this up here is uh, from First Southern, and they're going to want that back, so we can't uh, give that away, but... Uh, we're glad that we can pay it forward because it's been given to us too, so that's encouraging. Um, as you can see, the theme for this year was the God of the universe, and the theme verse um, is Colossians. It says, uh, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him, and for him. So, if we're intending to look at the God of the universe, then it would make sense for us to actually start at the beginning. So, if you'll open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 1. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1, we're going to read through verse 3. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you've been in church in any sort of time, or if you've been around church for any sort of time, then you've probably heard that verse said, or those verses talked about, that God said, let there be light, and there was light. He didn't have to make something. He didn't have to do something. He simply said things into creation. You see, God was before there was absolutely anything. God was before, and God will be after there is anything. And so, God begins to His creation in Genesis. Um, again, we talked about the theme verse, and it says the exact same thing, that everything that we know of was created by God and in fact for God. And you can read the rest of Genesis and get the story of creation. It's, it's truth. A lot of the times we mix up truth for fable and oh, that's a poem and oh, that sounds really good and how does it match up with science and I'm not going to debate that with you. I'm simply telling you, you can read the rest of the story of creation and know that it's truth. If you'll flip your Bibles open to John chapter 1, we're going to look a little bit about the God of the universe and all of His creation and see what His creation begins to say about Himself. So John chapter 1, 
verses 1 through 3 say this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things come into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Again, maybe you've been in church sometime, and we know that that scripture is specifically talking about Jesus, so much so that it's saying Jesus was in the beginning. Jesus, it was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all in there before there was anything, and they thought to themselves, let's make something. And they begin to create things, and God the Father begins to speak things into creation and begins to mold things with His hands. And you can again read that story of creation, and then in John chapter 1 it begins to say that Jesus was there at the beginning. And in fact, it takes it a step further that everything that has ever been created has been created through Jesus and in fact for Jesus. So you and I sit here today and wonder how or what's my purpose on life or or how am I supposed to do this crazy thing called life. You and I were created for a specific purpose in Christ Jesus. Next, we're going to begin to look and see what his creation is physically saying about him. If you'll open up your Bibles to Psalms 19, verse 1. I know, we're getting Bible drills in today. It's good for you. Psalms chapter 19, starting in verse 1, it says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. So God, in the beginning, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit began to create everything. Maybe they spoke things into creation. God's, or scripture says they began to form things into creation. Either way, they created absolutely everything. And in Psalms, we're reading that absolutely everything is declaring God's glory. You and I can go and look at science, and science begins to declare God's glory. Some of our problem is we've been looking at science through different glasses. Sometimes you and I have begun to believe science or humans' interpretation of science over Scripture because, well, it just makes sometimes more sense. Or we do this, well, it's just easier to understand. Or it's just, uh, I I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I don't want to push back. So I can understand that, and yep, you know, they can present me evidence where it says that trees are millions of years old, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. In my theology class, we started to talk about that. and In fact, he made us separate and argue one side versus another side. And my question to the class was, what if the carbon dating system is off? What if our starting data is off? Then the rest of it is skewed. You see, the God of the universe began to create things, and what's saying He couldn't create a tree that looks hundreds of years old? The, all that aside, now we begin to see that His creation is screaming His glory. You and I are His creation. You and I begin to scream His glory. You and I begin to scream, There's a God! Then we begin to ask ourselves, if there's a God, then, then where do I fit in all of this? And we've read already that you and I were created with a purpose. You see, you and I were created by God for God. You and I were His crowning achievement. If you'll flip your Bibles open back to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read about his crowning creation. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to pick the story up in verse 26. And we're going to read through the rest of the chapter. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth. 
and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The reason we begin to see that we're his crowning creation is days one through five are good. Scripture says that God saw what he created on day one and it was good. God saw what he created on day two, three, four, and five and it was good. We get to day six and and God begins to create things on day six and then at the end of day six He begins to form man in His own image. And then at the very end of day six He said, it is very good. You and I are His crowning achievement. In fact, you and I are supposed to have dominion over the entire earth. You and I were supposed to live in perfect fellowship with Jesus. You see, Genesis 1 and 2 begin to explain a little bit of what heaven will look like. And you say, but Jeremy, that's the story of creation. How is that what heaven is supposed to look like? Heaven is this perfect fellowship with Jesus. That's how it was intended to be in the garden. You see, we've read the story of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, and we begin to see what it's supposed to be like. That fellowship that we're supposed to happen, that we're supposed to have with God, and we begin to walk with God. And, and Scripture then goes on to say in chapter 3 that Adam and Eve heard God's footsteps. Now, if you've been around me for any sort of time, you know that's my number one question. What does God's footsteps sound like? You see, I can sit in the basement at my house and I can hear Emma and Lily run around, and I can hear my wife walk around. But what do the footsteps of God walking through the garden sound like? How awesome is that? You see, in Genesis 1 and 2, that's what it was supposed to look like. It was supposed to look like us in fellowship with God, walking hand in hand and eating fruit and tending to the garden and being in perfect fellowship. One of my favorite words in Scripture is but. But something happened. If you'll flip open your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, that but we're going to read about. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Therefore, just as one man, as, as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, sin entered the world through one man. It wasn't um, a group of people who decided to get together. It wasn't just Eve and it wasn't just Adam. Scripture says that through Adam, sin entered the world. And we know that their eyes weren't open until Adam ate the fruit. So men, we can stop blaming the women. But we know through one man sin entered the world and spread to everyone. And we're going to read about sin. And sin is an archer's term. If you've been around archery at for... Well, this one you kind of have to be around it for a long time. But uh, in the olden days when they would have archery tournaments, they would have people down there at the targets. And the archer would shoot his bow and arrow and the arrow would fly through the air and hit the target, and if it missed the target, the people at the target end would go, Sin! Sin! And so we begin to see sin as missing the mark. In the archer's term, that's exactly what sin was. When they would miss the target, or when they would miss the bullseye, they would yell, Sin! Because they've missed the mark. 
We just read in Romans chapter 5 where you and I have sinned. You and I have missed the mark. If the mark is perfection, then you and I have missed it by a long shot. You and I have sinned and sinned and sinned, and we've missed that perfection. And some of you will sit here today and go, but Jeremy, uh, nobody's perfect, so why even try? Because if we go back to Genesis 1 and 2, it's supposed to look like that. We should try for that perfection. We should try to reach that level of perfection knowing you and I will never reach it this side of heaven. So why even try? Because God desires that relationship with us. You see, sin separates us from you, separates you and I from God. If God desires to have a relationship with, with us, then sin separates us. Something stops us from getting to Jesus on our own. Sin, we've missed the mark. If you can imagine going through your life one day and, and having somebody follow you around and every time you've missed the mark, sin, sin, as you're driving even, sin, Since the beginning of creation, we've seen, and you can read Scripture throughout the entire Bible. So in seminary, I was asked, if you could classify the Bible as a movie, what would you classify it as? And everyone's starting to go, oh, an action movie, and this movie, and that movie. And yes, it's all of those. The biggest theme that it would probably fit in is a romance. You see, in the very beginning of the movie, there's this relationship. And then something happens with that relationship, and it's torn. And throughout the rest of Scripture, we see God trying to get back His people. And then throughout the rest of the Bible, we see people attempting to get back with God, but then getting distracted. Sin. Getting taken away. Falling into their own understandings or their own thoughts or their own heart's desires. You see, throughout the creation of the world, God has had this plan in order to get us back to Him if we choose. Just as sin entered the world through one man, salvation has entered the world through one man, Jesus Christ. You see, God's plan gives us the opportunity to live in fellowship with God. If you open your Bibles to John 3.16, and I know your pastor should have this memorized, and I do have it memorized, but if I messed it up now, you guys would, I would never live it down. So John 3.16, and it's a good Bible. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish and have eternal life. For God so loved the world. Hey, world, church, that's you and I. That He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, that whoever, you and I are whoever. You and I are whoever. Your neighbor is whoever. Your co-worker is whoever. Your kids are whoever. Believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You see, you and I can have that perfect relationship or that perfect fellowship with Jesus if we so choose. God's paid that debt. God's made it possible for us to get into heaven. If you'll flip open your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Remember that sin? Remember that archer's term that messed up, but something happened in the garden? Sin! For all have fallen short of that perfection standard. All have missed the mark. You and I have sinned. You and I have fallen short of God's standard You know, I've lied, we've cheated, we've stole things in life. We've missed the mark, we've sinned. 
But overall, you'll sit here today and you'll go, but I'm a good person. Or, or maybe you'll say, but I'm not as bad as, and fill in the blank. We all try to do that. Well, or we'll measure up some person. Maybe we measure up somebody here in church across the aisle and we go, well, I know them and I'm not as bad as them. I don't know if you missed for all in that part, but for all of Maranatha Baptist Fellowship has sinned. For everyone sitting in this room today has sinned. You've missed the mark. There's separation between you and God. There's separation between me and God. But, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. This is my favorite verse. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, while you and I were still sinning, while you and I were still enemies of the living God, while you and I were still destined to spend eternity separated from Christ in a place called hell, Christ loved us so much, He died for us. It, it wasn't, I got myself cleaned up and I can come to church now and see Jesus. Or, or I fixed my life up and I can see Jesus. Now it's, while we're yet sinners... While you and I are still enemies of the living God, while you and I are still wrapped up in sin, Christ loved us enough to die for us. See, the difficult part for you and I to understand is we don't get that. We don't understand how God can love an enemy so much that He pays their debt. No way you and I would pay our enemy's debt. No way you and I would, would deal with someone and then be backstabbed and be drugged through the mud and then turn around and go pay their house off. No way. You and I can't even begin to comprehend that sort of love apart from Jesus. If you'll flip open your Bibles to Romans 6.23... It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, you and I understand debt. You and I understand that what we do, sometimes there's consequences for everything we do. There's good consequences and there's bad consequences. Sometimes there are good consequences if we do something good. We get a reward or we know that if we go speeding through town that the chances of us getting stopped and getting a ticket increase. You and I understand that if we do something wrong, there's a consequence to be paid. There's no difference in sin. You see, that sin that missed the mark, that, oh, I'm not as bad as, for all have sinned. Because we've missed the mark, you and I deserve death. And I know that's harsh, but that's Scripture talking. You and I deserve death and separation from God because the perfect God cannot be part of sin. So you and I, because we've sinned, deserve death. We just read in Romans 5 where Jesus died for our sins. For the wages, and in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death, but, there's that but again, the free gift of God, Jesus in John 3.16, where Jesus was sent to die on the cross, Jesus was nailed to a cross, the perfect Lamb of God died for you and I, and three days later conquered death and rose and walks again. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Some of you will sit here and go, hey, that sounds good, but I really don't understand it, so I'm good. Some of you will sit here and go, that sounds really great, and in a perfect world, I would be all on board with that, but Jeremy, you don't know my sin. Can I tell you something? You cannot out -sin God. When you begin to think about that, and I'm glad you kind of laugh because that's amazing, you cannot out -sin God. Hmm. The last few weeks we talked about you and I cannot encounter enough storms in life that God's peace runs out. 
You and I cannot out God. So if you sit here today and you begin to go, yeah, that sounds great, but Jeremy, you don't know my past. You're right, I don't know your past. I, I, I tell you somebody who does, Jesus knows your past and Jesus still loves you so much, He thinks you're to die for. And in fact, He did die for you. And then some of you will sit here and go, hey, that sounds great, and, and I'm a pretty good person, so, yeah, sure. And some of you will sit here and go, you know, that sounds great, but I'm not interested. For those of you who are interested in this, if you'll flip open your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Starting in verse 9, we're actually going to read through 13. It says, That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the Scripture says, Whoever believes in Him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all abounding in riches for all who call on Him. Then 13, For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So some of you are sitting here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And then you begin to go, Well, that sounds great, Jeremy, but how do I get that perfect fellowship with Jesus? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Read that. Go home and read that. And read that and read that. It says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, Scripture is very clear. You will be saved. And if it stopped there, we would go about our lives like nothing ever happened and we would do that and we would be fine and we would be in perfect fellowship with Jesus. But there are some people who go, well, I don't know if giving up my life that I'm in control of to go with Jesus is worth it. Scripture then takes it one step further and says that you and I will not be disappointed. You see, it gives us 100% satisfaction guaranteed. If you and I are willing to give our lives to Jesus, then you and I will not be disappointed. And then there's some of you that will go, well, yeah, Jeremy, but what are the strings? What will it cost me? Frankly, it will cost you your life. But Scripture says if we're willing to give our life for the sake of Jesus, it's very clear when it says that you will then find your life. You don't understand true freedom without Jesus. You don't understand true life without Jesus. Jesus gives us that opportunity to come into that perfect fellowship with Jesus. You see, you and I can know the God of the universe, the God who spoke the stars into existence. That is um, a Bell 370. That is from the Hubble telescope. Jesus has a plan for everyone's life, including mine and yours. This last week we talked about the God of the universe who created everything big and small, desires a relationship with you. And then the last night, I know Doyle talked a little bit about it, that Jay and Gail brought their daughter's telescope. <laughs> brought their daughter's telescope out and set it up, and, and Jay got it all positioned in and pushed a whole bunch of buttons, and it moved, and, and then he moved it some more. Um, and then he started to, we started to watch the moon, and, and that was cool. And then he changed the lens on it um, to a bigger lens, and we got to see detailed of the moon. And when we got to see the detail of the moon, we got to see the craters, and you could see, I don't know what they're called, little bumps and mountains and hills, and we call them hills in Kansas. Um, but the craters on the moon and different sides of the moon, and it just blew my mind that God, who created the moon and that far away, and that's not even the biggest thing that He's created, still desires a relationship with me. God created the entire universe, the galaxies, 
and still de desires to have a personal relationship with you and I. We're going to move into a time of invitation, and as they begin to play something uh, up there, would you consider maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus? Maybe you're one of those people that have began to understand that, yep, I've missed the mark and yes, I've sinned, and I know for a fact that the God of the universe desires to have a relationship with me, but something stops us. I hope you understand from today that that something is sin. And maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I would love to have you come down front and maybe we can talk about that and I can show you or we can show you through Scripture on how you can have that personal relationship with Jesus. Or maybe you just want to simply talk and get questions answered and go home and decide. Maybe you're here and God has been moving in your life and, and you're a believer, but like most believers, you've probably strayed away and attempted to do things on your own. I can tell you for a fact, God is waiting with open arms for you to come home. Or maybe you need to make another decision. Or maybe it's just simply you need to come down front and pray. And spend some time alone with Jesus. Whatever your decision is, I would ask that you would simply be obedient to what he's calling you to do. Father God, we thank you for this time where we can see through scripture that you've created everything and you desire to have a relationship with us. We can see, God, where you've loved us, where you've sent your Son to die on a cross. God, and Scripture points out that if we don't, if we confess you and believe in our hearts, God, then we can be saved and we can have that satisfaction guaranteed of walking with you. God, I pray that there are people here today who don't know you, God, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you would break them of that. God, I pray that you'd begin to draw people to you draw people into a right relationship with you, God. Lord, we ask that we would be obedient to what you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to pray, and we're going to bless the food, um, and we're going to go downstairs and eat. I did not cook any of the hot dogs, uh, so you can be, Cody cooked all the hot dogs, so you can be sure that they're cooked and not burnt and all this other sort of stuff. So, um, don't forget, if you filled out a member's card in the box, there's a, a blue box. Um, if you would put that in there, we would love to make contact with you later. Uh, and... Uh, after food, we'll be moving outside to play some water games and apparently throw a pie in my face. And If we don't get to it, it's all right. It'll be okay. So let me pray, and then we can go downstairs and eat. Father God, we thank you so much for this time of fellowship. I pray that you bless this food to nourish my bodies. Lord, I pray that you bless the hands that prepared this food. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.